nice to see you all. Welcome. All right, we'll set our motivation. Sange churam sogi chona bhai janchu bhadu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yangi pe sonam gi rola penji sange rupa sho sange churam sogi chona bhai janchu bhadu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yangi pe sonam gi Rola penche sange rupa sho sange churam sogi chunam la jancho bharu dhani kapsu chi dagi chunyen gi pe sonam gi rola penche sange rupa sho letting the motivation connect Okay, so we, today we're going to start Medicine Buddha, and Medicine Buddha is a really interesting practice, especially in terms of thinking about karma and thinking about dependent arising and what makes things powerful or what makes things significant, um, ways to help those who are sick, who are dying, those ways to help people, um, beings in the lower realms, including animals. So there's a lot with Medicine Buddha that you can do. And there's also a lot of questions that probably come up when you read about Medicine Buddha. Pretty much any teaching on Medicine Buddha will bring up similar questions. And if you haven't had those questions yet, I'm sure that they'll come. So I'll preempt the questions by <laughs> making you question them now. So the first question that might arise is, what does Rinpoche and any number of other commentators mean when they say, just by reciting the mantra, beings are liberated from the lower realms? And you're like, oh, just like that. That's great. Okay, <laughs> done, right? Um, but then part of you goes, but, but there's still animals. I see them. There's deer right outside. They're in the lower realms. Yeah. And you might think, all right, well, people have passed away and been reborn. And even if they're in the quote upper realms of being a human being, there's war and there's poverty and there's, you know, natural disasters and all sorts of things. And so obviously, like there must be more to the story. So you read these commentaries and I'm guessing like at first you're really uplifted and you think how amazing, such a powerful mantra and it's so powerful for this time, this degenerate time. What's a degenerate time? Anyway, very powerful for this time, you know, and you're very inspired, but then you give it a little bit of space and a little bit of contemplation and probably different questions arise. So I am guessing some of that has arisen already, even just in reading the chapter, the Medicine Buddha chapter, if you've started it yet. Did, have you had some of those thoughts of, that's great, but how? Or that's great, but why? You know, some of that stuff come up. And you're like, well, no, but now it has. God, thank you. No. <laughs> it was all fine before you planted those seeds. Look, it's it's an interesting thing because um, a lot of the conversation about Medicine Buddha is going to be really relevant, particularly when we talk about the very powerful mantras at the time of death at the very end of the book, because similar issues will come up of just by saying this, this will happen or from the side of the mantra or from the side of the deity. And you'll hear all of these framings that makes it sound like everything you learned about emptiness in the past somehow gets put on hold. So it's um, if you haven't had those questions yet, bring them up <laughs> to yourself and see. So um, I'll unpack it a little bit and see if um, you can come to some different ways of thinking about it, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion about it. So I'll start with just kind of the basics of Medicine Buddha and kind of the general presentation and then sharpen the horns of the dilemma about how do things have power and what does it mean to say from their own side or from the side of this or from the side of that when we've been so thoroughly trained that nothing exists from its own side. So um, coming up next, <laughs> more confusion. Um, also inspiration. 
So this is chapter five, if you're looking at the book, and I'll pull out some bits from the book in the PowerPoint. But here's just the first like kind of easy peasy, nice, what does the iconography mean? So when we visualize Medicine Buddha to recite the mantra, we visualize main Medicine Buddha. So Medicine Guru, King of Lapis Light. And in the center of a lotus is a white moon disc. Seated on the moon disc is Medicine Buddha, one face, two arms. He is blue in color, like a very clear, very blue sky, radiating blue light from his body. In the past, we translated Benduria, the color of the Medicine Buddha, as Lapis Lazuli, but this seems incorrect. Although there doesn't seem to be an exact translation in English, we can take it to be Sapphire. So <laughs> which blue is Medicine Buddha? There seems to be some uh, confusion based on translation, but we know Medicine Buddha is blue. Which blue? Is it Lapis Lazuli? Is it Sapphire? something very royal radiant blue this is what we know so his right hand rests on his right knee palm up in the mudra of granting sublime realizations so similar to shakyamuni buddha only the hand is going the other way he holds the stem of an arura plant between his thumb and index finger arura is the special plant that heals both the sickness of mind and sickness of the body destroying all suffering and its causes. His left hand is in the mudra of concentration. That's the one um, like that. And in it, he holds a lapis lazuli bowl filled with immortal nectar that destroys death and pacifies the chronic disease of the delusions. He is seated in the full lotus position and is wearing the three red colored robes of a monk. He has all the signs and holy exemplifications of a Buddha. Okay, so that's straight from the text, and it's just kind of describing the appearance of Medicine Buddha. And like with all Buddhas, when we visualize them, we imagine that they are um, radiating light, they are made of transparent light, and they're three-dimensional and very present and real. And then it goes on to say, even though he appears to us as truly existent, every part of Medicine Buddha's holy body is merely labeled by the mind. The head, the hands, the legs, and the begging bowl, the aurora plant, everything merely labeled by the mind. So put a pin in that, like hold that statement. This is a statement from Lama Zopa Rinpoche, which he will seem to contradict in a few more paragraphs. So, so far now we're still looking at uh, Medicine Buddha in the relative conventional sense. And when the Medicine Buddha was a bodhisattva, called Stainless Star, one of the many prayers he made for us sentient beings was this. So he said, when I become the medicinal king, the king of lapis light, may any sentient being who recites my mantra or hears my name or sees, hears, touches or remembers me or does the recitation meditation, never have any sickness or harm. May they have a long life, the Dharma and wealth. There is no doubt that for any sentient being who makes a statue of Medicine Buddha or does concentration or meditation on Medicine Buddha, but even for someone who doesn't concentrate on Medicine Buddha, but simply expresses my name or even makes seven steps in my direction, which means towards a Medicine Buddha statue or to do a puja. The door to the evil gone realms, which means the lower realms and to samsara will be closed. May they be born in the higher realms, have all the seven qualities, and achieve peerless enlightenment. May the power of my prayers equal to that of all the Buddhas of the fortunate eon, especially in regard to profundity, extensiveness, and power. So the seven qualities are a good social class, a beautiful body, a long life, a life free from illness, prosperity, wealth, and great wisdom. So when we see those things, that can be a little triggering, like good social class, beautiful, what? The others, okay, but what? And what they're saying is these are situations conducive to having a positive influence on others. They're also situations conducive to having the resources and support to practice the Dharma. So we're remembering that concepts of social class and beautiful body are all relative and they change culture to culture 
era to era. But generally speaking, if you have a pleasant and friendly countenance and you're not undergoing a lot of deprivation in terms of your resources, life's going to be a little bit easier for your practice, theoretically. So this is the prayer the Medicine Buddha Stainless Star made when he was a bodhisattva. And this is one part of the dependent arising that's important to understand. So us as we are probably already have a certain affinity with certain people. Like they find us comforting or they come to us for advice or they come to us for care or we just seem to attract them. Like I think of my friend, children, she's a nun who used to work in a hospice. And even when we are just like grocery shopping, people come up to her and want to tell her about a recent bereavement, right? Like she just has the karma for people to talk to her about death and dying and grief and loss. When I'm out by myself, I seem to attract people with chemical dependency issues and traumatic brain injuries. Yep, they find me, they love me. I just have to plan for it, right? And, you know, even in Boulder Creek just the other day. So, you know, like somehow there's something in my, you know, affect, something in my karma that um, makes folks like that feel safe or makes them feel like I'm not going to be mean to them if they approach me. But I don't get tons of people talking to me about recent bereavements, grief, and loss, unless they're already at a Dharma center and come wanting to talk to someone about that, it'll wind up being me, right? So it's like I have a spectrum of people I might be able to talk to, but there's a lot of trending towards people with chemical dependency issues and traumatic brain injuries. So perhaps when I'm a Buddha, that will be the first people I will gather to my pure land. <laughs> Who can say? Who can say? Now, if you're thinking about your own life, it might be that, you know, you always wind up in communities of a certain kind of artist. And, you know, even you loved ceramics as a child, haven't done anything with ceramics, but ever since you keep meeting potters, something totally random. Yeah. But you just keep bumping into the same sort of people in situations that you wouldn't expect. Do you feel that sometimes? You know, or like maybe, you know, people who have a certain kind of uh, sense of humor or people who have a certain kind of whatever. Anyway, this is just kind of food for thought. Now, what we want to do is to kind of think, well, maybe I could be more directive about that. Who do I attract and who do I benefit? Maybe I can be very specific about, well, already I have an affinity to help people suffering in this specific way. And I want to help the suffering of all sentient beings. Yeah. So I want to help the suffering of all sentient beings. But maybe if I get specific, it's going to help me be more focused and more powerful. Because sometimes when we say to ourselves, may all sentient beings be free from suffering, we don't have that same visceral compassion arise as when someone just comes to our doorstep crying then the compassion just flows, they're right in our face. But when we have a generic sense of all sentient beings, it's a little bit more amorphous. So if you can think of like, what kind of people touch your heart? What kind of people elicit compassion very easily and quickly? And then they are your gateway to opening up compassion to all sentient beings. Yeah, because they, they make it come up very easily. And maybe it's animals. Maybe it's a certain kind of animal. So you use that as your gateway or your catalyst for the mentality you want to elicit for all. And you can be thinking, when I'm a bodhisattva, when I'm a Buddha, may I really directly benefit people with traumatic brain injuries or whatever it is. Yeah. And, and then it might be that when people of that type do prayers to you, it's going to have a lot more karmic impact, the two dependent arisings coming together. So all of the nuances of karma, the complications of karma are so vast, like just the whole web of interconnection of what makes one tiny thing happen is so elaborate. But what we do know is that when there is concentrated, repeated effort, that builds depth and power. You know, there's a power in promises. You know, it's nice to be nice to someone for one day, but if you get married to them and decide to be nice to them every day, it might have a, kind of a depth and a continuity and a power because some days you're not going to like them, but you've decided to be nice anyway. 
right? <laughs> like a good marriage on a good day. Like I know anything about marriage, but I'm guessing, right? You know, and you, probably you feel that as parents also. There's all sorts of ways where kind on one day is good, but a continuity of kindness or a continuity of choice or a continuity of promise day after day has built depth and power. So it's that kind of thinking and psychology that underpins why praying to medicine Buddhas is more powerful now. More powerful now because they made prayers to be more powerful now. What is now? Now is the degenerate age. Why is it the degenerate age? It's the time since a full-fledged, full Nirmanakaya aspect of a Buddha manifested in a way that said, I am enlightened, I am a Buddha, and I'm going to teach you the whole path to enlightenment since Shakyamuni Buddha died, basically, is the degenerate age. And it will continue to be the degenerate age until the karma of sentient beings is ripe for the next Buddha to show the fully fledged Nirmanakaya aspect in all aspects, the 12 deeds to teach the whole Dharma path. And the one we think that will be is Maitreya, who already exists, who is already a Buddha. He's just hanging out in Tashita, right? And emanating everywhere, you know, because Buddhas. So Shakyamuni Buddha isn't like the only Buddha, nor is he gone, even though his body died. Buddhas pervade every atom of existence. The Dharmakaya mind of Buddhas pervades everywhere. But it's only occasionally that we sentient beings have enough merit, causes, and conditions to see one and know them to be a Buddha, for them to say that they're a Buddha and be able to prove it. Yeah, to be able to be, you know, shining, radiant with light, to be able to show miracles. That's a rare case. And if a regular human being says that they're enlightened or says they're a Buddha, you need to say to them, okay, well, show me your miracles, because otherwise, how will we prove it? You know, take a chopstick, stab it into the earth and have a million trees grow out of it. Shakyamuni Buddha did that. Can you do that? Yeah, because otherwise, how can we prove it? They could just be a charlatan with charisma and education, you know? So it's a rare case that uh, there is the karma for a Buddha to say they're a Buddha and to show all the aspects of a Buddha. So when that happens, like in the case of Shakyamuni Buddha, that's a huge amount of merit. And then when they pass away, there's a degeneration of lifespan, of life force, of quarreling of natural disasters, of medicines being less effective, of all sorts of difficult things because the merit of sentient things is on the wane, but it's going to wax again. Have I used those correctly, moon-wise? Anyway, going down, going up, yes? So just think about history and how we have 
a dark age and then we have a renaissance and then we have a dark age and then we have a renaissance and then we have a dark age and then we have a renaissance and that is the way human history has gone on this planet probably since the dawn of time but definitely since recorded history where it can get pretty bleak and then towards the end of that then there's kind of a patching ourselves up. Um, there's a surge of new religions or new understandings of religion, of various spiritual leaders teaching ethics and kindness, of flourishing of art and music and literature and architecture, and kind of things blossom into creativity for a while, and then they collapse again and it gets dark again and like that, right? So it kind of ebbs and flows. And within each of those spans, there's little ebbs and flows as well, yeah? So just because we're in a dark period and it may get worse doesn't mean it's forever and doesn't mean it's actually the worst thing on earth. Because when things are hard, it forces practice in a different way than when things are easy. God realm beings right now have no manifest suffering or very little until the time of their death. But does that make them practice? No, they just frolic. <laughs> yes, they just frolic and have flower garlands and have relationships and have minor dramas and a sort of Greek god sort of tragedy. The gods and demigods are sort of fighting and having pleasure and they are not practicing because there's no impetus to practice. They are not practicing because they're so far away from the suffering of sentient things. It's not relatable. Yeah, like think of maybe if you have the sort of very wealthy friend who hasn't been a proactive philanthropist, who's kind of let themselves get separated from the suffering of regular people. They're not bad, right? These wealthy people, they're not bad. They're just so far away from the immediacy of suffering of regular folks. It doesn't occur to them how much they could help. Yeah, because it's just too separate from their experience. And this can happen to us, right? When things are going really well, our relationships are going well, our finances are going well, our health is okay. When things are kind of settled, it's easy to forget how much people suffer unless you make yourself notice or there's someone in your life who forces it to you. So the fact that we're in a degenerate age where things are getting really difficult, you know, pandemic stuff, that's all predicted climate stuff that's all predicted and we do the best we can with conditions and kind of like minimize the negative impact but it might not be fixable right the world might not be fixable it can be gently made less painful but we're not going to stop the tide but what we can do is train our minds and directing our thoughts to the medicine buddhas they knew this was coming and they planned for it and they put a huge amount of practice energy into being of benefit at this time. So it said very, very good idea to practice medicine Buddha in some way often during this time period. It will help keep you healthier mentally and physically and it will help you be of benefit to others more directly. But because dependent arising, not because of like magic spells, or they're somehow a special breed of Buddha that's magically more special than other Buddhas, not because of that. It's because of all of the energy they put into the, these prayers they made. How, how does that land so far? Is there a kind of a logic to it that makes sense? Or do you feel questions, doubts? Yeah, there's a kind of sense to it, yeah. And you don't have to, you know, take that on face value, like really let yourself play with how that might be. Think your way around it from lots of different angles. Um, yes, yeah, Nay, go ahead. This is something I've been trying to think about, especially in the last few weeks of teachings, um, you know, to separate out causes and conditions from substantial causes. The mm -hmm. one thing in my mind, I always wondered, like when you, you know, when we just read that beautiful aspiration of medicine Buddha, and I think, you know, but, you know, he wishes from his side that anybody who remembers him and so forth will have long life, not get sick, blah, blah, blah. But I do remember him and people do remember him and we do get sick and, you know, all these things yeah. happen. But now I'm trying to think like, you know, he's a cause and condition. I'm the substantial cause. Is that correct? Like, and, and so, you know, it, I have to do something from my side for those causes and conditions to benefit. Yeah. Okay. 
exactly exactly it like we need to plant the seed and reaching out is what helps water it but you could reach out to a chocolate bar and it can sort of give you temporary happiness or you could reach out to medicine buddhas and it give you more long-term happiness and protection so either one could ripen some seeds of happiness for you but what's going to be a more powerful watering and what's a more powerful seed that you want watered all of that is so complicated with karma but indeed it's always your seeds that are getting watered they're it's almost like they're um a more nutritious kind of fertilizer there's lots of fertilizer but right now that per, that that fertilizer is going to be particularly useful for your own mind stream yeah christine hi venro yantin um so how do the 35 confession buddhas relate to the medicine buddha yeah, that's a good question. And we're going to do 35 Buddhas um, soon. So I might not, um, I might not oh, that's okay. do that tonight. Yeah, but it's coming up for sure. It's coming okay. up and remind me if I forget. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. But similarly, yeah, all of the medicine Buddhas, or excuse me, all of the 35 Buddhas similarly made prayers to help sentient beings purify specific things. Yeah. So similarly, why they're powerful is because of the prayers they did during their practice time. Okay. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's kind of cosmic stuff and it's, it's easy to kind of go back and forth between kind of fantastical, magical, mystical ways of thinking. And then like cynicism, <laughs> you know, well, at least for me, right. Either go back and forth between like magic rainbows. This is the most like beautiful, inspiring stuff. And then I recite the mantra and I feel all beautiful and happy and sending out light rays and it's wonderful. Or I like go into complete cynicism. That's like, wait, why though? Why? You know, and this can happen to any of us and we can sort of, um, fall into the trap of thinking it didn't work because I said it and they said it would work just magically just like that and then forgetting that we didn't read the fine print and the fine print is you also need to connect in the right way with the conditions so with the medicine buddhas it's one of these things where if you do the practice with a happy grounded connected mind without expectations it's probably going to go well Right. And if you do it with a tight mind of pressure, expectations, forcing, um, almost with a mind of, come on, prove it, Buddhas, you know, or um, if I really, really plead, if I really, really plead, that'll convince them. It's probably not going to work out well. Prayer is about a link and a connection. It's not about a beseeching and a pleading and a like, save me. It's opening the gateway between yourself and the divine. Yeah. And so imagine they're always flooding you, but you're not feeling it until you open. The prayers help you open. I, I, have, a, I have already asked you this question, but again, I was like, put it beside, but it comes again. So maybe this time I will understand better. Mm, I think about the um, medicine Buddha, because it's, like medicine and people are suffering i go in the side that the suffering of sentient being is the cause of them coming although i know that they are all all the time they are here but would you please explain again is it the suffering of us sentient being made us more receptive because we we don't go to the movies we are not, we know all knows that uh, the planet is burning i don't know and all this um is, is your question what makes the buddhas come is that yeah. the question what so, what what is the link because they are medicine and they come to help you're not asking them to come they're already here what you're asking is yourself to be open to that. What makes you ask yourself to be open to that is any number of things. So sometimes seeing suffering or having suffering 
makes you want to connect with something deep and profound, but it's just as easy to make suffering of someone else or your own suffering make you shut down and retreat to, you know, basic sensory soothing or any number of distractions. So not in and of itself is suffering going to connect you to your practice. Similarly, joy, right? Like when you're happy and stable and comfortable, you might think, great, I have time and space to practice. Mm -hmm. Or you'll be happy and comfortable and you think, great, I'm just going to relax and flop in a heap. You know, it's mm -hmm. not like any of these things are the linkage per se. You have to be proactive from your side and decide whether happiness or suffering, mm -hmm. I want to practice the path. What's going to be the thing that supports my path? I'm going to choose Medicine Buddha as the format, but any number of formats could assist this progress. But it helps to choose something because it directs and orients our mind. It helps us to focus. And then we're connecting with all of the amazing practice and work that they've already done, like riding their coattails. Mm -hmm. We're not reinventing the wheel. Yeah. So what what connects the Buddhas and us is us because they're already here. Mm -hmm. Even when the prayers say, please come here, they're already here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even when we say, please stay, they're going to stay. We're doing this to remind ourselves to be open to the divine. Mm -hmm. They need no convincing. They have perfect compassion. Mm -hmm. No convincing is necessary. I mean, make it really ordinary. Like we're already nice enough people. Yes. <laughs> We're nice enough people. If someone says, can you please help me? With a lot of our friends and family, it goes without saying. They didn't even need to ask. We were already there. But by them asking, they've created an opening and a receptivity to be helped. Yes, if we were just exactly. knocking on their door every day saying, can I help you? Can I help you? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't work. They have to open the door. Yes. Yeah. Or exactly. knock on ours, right? Yeah. So imagine once our own mind is fully developed into enlightenment, it's going to be like that times a gazillion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that we're just there. Of course, it goes without saying, I want to help you, but you need to ask for the help. Otherwise, I can't do anything. My hands are tied. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's so helpful. Thank you, Venerable. Yeah, yeah. No, and keep keep asking if it gets cloudy again, because it's, it's important to kind of mm -hmm. suss out that, that relationship and that connection for yeah. sure. Okay, so so these guys, um, the, the prayer that I just said, that above prayer was <clears throat> one that the Medicine Buddha made when he was a Bodhisattva, and he and all seven of the Medicine Buddhas did so many prayers for us sentient beings, that in this degenerate times, which is now, all our wishes might succeed, meaning Dharma wishes or positive wishes. So reciting the Medicine Buddha's mantra or the names of the seven Medicine Buddhas every day purifies whatever karma we have to be reborn in the lower realms. That was the main guarantee by the main Medicine Buddha and other Medicine Buddhas, which may lead to thoughts of how is this true? <laughs> Why is this true? Like words like guarantee are tricky or purifies whatever karma we have. Those words are potentially problematic, although they're perfect, and Rinpoche, of course, is correct, but a lot of explanation needs to be had. When you see the word of whatever karma we have to be reborn in the lower realms will be purified, all of it, and that guarantee, that's something that needs a lot of unpacking. You know, when you when you read things like that, I'm guessing there's, again, that part that's inspired and that part that is questioning. and what we're talking about here is very much the Tantra view. Okay, so the Tantra view is taking the result as the path. And taking the result as the path in so many different areas is a little bit of a like a mind twister. Because you're adopting an attitude while knowing it's not true yet. But by adopting the attitude, it becomes more true more quickly. So you're saying... I have now purified all negative seeds for the lower realms, even though you haven't. <laughs> and the Buddha and the medicine Buddhas have guaranteed that this will happen, even though they can't guarantee that because they cannot change your mind. They can only be a positive influence on it. But what you're doing in the practice itself is giving yourself as many seconds as you can to live in that future potentiality, to say it has been purified. It has been purified. 
and to let yourself rest in that truth and that belief which will be true in the future similar to when you finally have the empowerment then you're arising as the fully fledged buddha while knowing you're not the fully fledged buddha but in the practice time itself you're adopting the attitude that you are and you're giving yourself the divine pride and the clear appearance that it is already true and what that does is bring you closer to it and then in your everyday life it also means that the best of you is more kind of accessible and prevalent than your more afflicted aspect and if you're living the best version of yourself the most developed version of yourself so far it's like exercise then you know for a while you'll plateau and that's as good as it gets and then you'll start to stretch again and your best is actually something even better and then that becomes the norm and then a new best and a new best all the way until enlightenment but not just like a best in a kind of perfectionist trap a happiness as well a contentment as well so by picturing yourself purified imagining yourself having let go of the baggage of beginningless mistakes from beginningless time and beginningless habits of ignorance and attachment and anger and really thinking that everything heavy in the heart and everything heavy in the body is just gone all you are is light and happy and compassion now lifted and able to be fully developed even just feeling that to be true for a few seconds makes it truer than it was do you do you kind of feel the psychology of that and and how it really does lead to that being true and it's not the same thing as some like new agey thing of like manifesting stuff or like some like pop psychology like framing of you know like project it into the future that'll make it so or like visualize your goals and then you'll achieve them i'll see myself on the top of mount everest then i'll be able to climb the mountain like that stuff has its benefit and it works sort of and you know there's also a lot of pitfalls and it can get very egoistic you know but sometimes it's well intended and works well enough that's good stuff, but that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is something a lot deeper than that. Yeah, Christine, go ahead. So it's interesting. I'm reading a book called The Upward Spiral, written by a, a, neuro, a neurologist, hmm. uh, neuroscientist. And he actually talks about the neurology of what happens when we imagine a future better result. Hmm. And what happens with the brain when that, and it it is shown to reverse um, depression and to reverse negative thinking. And so they, you know, the Dalai Lama loves this, you know, the advances in the, the field of neurology. And this book talks about the exact same thing that you're talking about as being a way of changing the downward spiral into yeah. an upward spiral. Absolutely. And, and they're showing the, how it happens with the different parts of the brain. So anyway, I think that's very fascinating. It's called the upwards. I think it's called the upwards. No, I can't remember the name of it. Let me see. I can tell you in a sec. Um, it's called, um, if anyone's interested, the upward sp spiral. Fabulous no, book. Very it's, technical. Yeah. No, and it's great when you have those science parallels, right? Because whether we frame it like that or not, we do have kind of a, bl a blind faith in science. <laughs> Right. We want to think we have a faith based in reason and experience in science, but actually it's no, it's just the religion we were brought up with is to trust science. And <laughs> I have a, like a science yeah. right. background. Right. Some of us from a science background. But the Dalai Lama loves it too. He loves seeing the science. I, I'm with you. No, I'm with you. And I'm just oh, teaching. And um, you know, science has that spirit of inquiry and logic and testing. And it's so important that we find scientific backing for these philosophical truths because all of it has to be tested against logic and tested against experience and the thing about the spiritual path is that there's a limit to what can be tested until you yeah. have a certain level of experience but if at least there's some thread of logic to make you be able to practice in the meantime and you know the benefits in the immediate exist it can give you energy to do it and sometimes that ammunition of knowing that science backs it up can give you the inspiration to keep going with the things that'll take longer to prove experientially especially so with our western mind 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's such yeah. a different culture. Sometimes it's just challenging, just the cultural bridge to bridge those different cultures. In, you know. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and Lama Sopa Rinpoche is such a, a beautiful being. And, you know, when you're with him, there's just so much obvious palpable love and compassion. And he obviously believes everything he's saying and practices what he says. And sometimes the way he says it, you're like, but that doesn't make sense. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and he wouldn't mind if we argued with him, he would encourage an argument, right? Like they, you know, they love a debate, our Tibetan lamas, but, you know, just because they have this palpable kindness and obvious wisdom doesn't mean they need to go unchallenged when they say things that need more context or the context we're coming at it from is going to make us misunderstand. So, um, so this book is, is, is fairly good at not having too many of those like Rinpoche isms, but this chapter has a ton of them, which is like, he's right. And that needs a lot of explanation for you to understand how it's right and not crazy. But of course, some people don't need all of that intellectualization. They're just like, Hey, that's great. Okay. I'll do it. You know, and they're happy to just practice as written and not worry about it. And that is lovely. If you can, if you can do it, but um, over time, my experience has been that for myself and for others, that only works in a certain context. And then something, life or time or whatever is gonna make you question the why of it. And so you need some ammunition about how am I going to address the why of it once the initial inspiration wears off. But of course, for some people, that initial inspiration doesn't wear off and they can just happily go on along without challenging those words that are kind of confusing. So anyway, I apologize if I planted to doubt some people that we're never going to have any, but <laughs> I feel like might as well cut to the chase, have the doubt, resolve the doubt, moving on, right? Let's see, how is this true? Why is this true? Now it's going to get a little worse, <laughs> okay? before it gets better all right before it gets better it's going to get a little worse so Rinpoche says when we recite the medicine buddha mantra any being who hears us not just humans but also animals birds and insects will never be born in the lower realms again in that way not only do we take care of ourselves each day by reciting the medicine buddha mantra and doing the practice we are also able to take care of others when the texts talk about the benefits of reciting the Medicine Buddha mantra and the names of the Medicine Buddhas, we can take these as definitive teachings, not interpretive. It's not that they say such and such, but we must try to understand that there is another meaning there. When the texts tell us that chanting the mantra saves from the lower realms, they mean exactly that. Therefore, when I recite mantras for animals or human beings, one of the mantras I always recite is the Medicine Buddha mantra to prevent them from ever being reborn in the lower realms. Whenever we meet somebody, we should do this. Okay, so there's a lot there, and we need to see this passage as a critical thinking invitation, particularly where Rinpoche says we can take these as definitive teachings, not interpretive. It's not that they say such and such, but we must try to understand there's another meaning there. Okay, that part is problematic and not problematic, but it definitely needs to be unpacked. Okay, so when he says that these teachings are definitive, that is like asking for a debate <laughs> because the definition of definitive is Ex the content is explicitly on ultimate truth related to the wisdom realizing emptiness. Yeah. So Tantra in this context, it's not talking about emptiness in this context, but everything in Tantra is the unification of wisdom and method. Wisdom's implied even when it's only method discussed. So in that sense, okay, definitive. In another sense, it's just like the previous statement about purification where if you adopt the attitude that it's definitive, it gives you more momentum, it brings you closer to the goal or the result. 
So you think it is definitely true without a doubt if you hold that for a few seconds and then relax back into your ordinary doubts, but just kind of adopting the attitude of how about it's true just as it's said without going too far into elaboration, playing with the possibility of that. There's intriguing places to go. But just in case the, that kind of statement turns you into a fundamentalist, we need to bring in Lama Tsongkhapa for some support. Okay, so we are now going to bring in Lama Tsongkhapa, and this is directly from the Lama Rin Chenmo. So above is Rinpoche, below is Lama Tsongkhapa. And this is from the insight chapter of the Lama Rin Chenmo, where it's fulfilling the prerequisites for insight. So, Rim, so Lama Tsongkhapa says, you should listen to the stainless textual systems, relying on a scholar who accurately understands the key points of the scriptures, an indispensable prerequisite for insight is to use the wisdom gained through study and reflection to develop knowledge of reality. For without a decisive view of how things exist, you cannot develop insight that knows the real nature, emptiness. Also, in seeking such a view, you must not rely on that which has provisional meaning, but rather that which is definitive. Therefore, you should differentiate between the provisional and the definitive, and you should then internalize the meaning of the definitive scriptures. So then what are provisional and what are definitive? Those who wish to know reality must rely on the conqueror's scriptures. However, due to the diversity of ideas among his disciples, the scriptures vary. Hence, you might wonder what sort of scripture you should rely upon in seeking the meaning of the profound reality. You must know reality in reliance upon scriptures of definitive meaning. What sort of scripture is definitive and what sort is provisional? This is determined by the way of the subjects that they discuss. Those that teach the ultimate are considered scriptures of definitive meaning and those that teach conventionalities are considered scriptures of provisional meaning. So that's the key part, okay? So when we're talking about sutra and when we're talking in general in Buddhism, all of the content in Buddhism is divided into that which is provisional and that which is um, definitive, okay? That which is provisional is all the stuff about convention. Yeah, everything that needs to be interpreted in order to understand. The only things that are definitive are things that point directly to the ultimate, the fact that all things are empty of inherent existence. So if the subject matter is not emptiness, it's not definitive, which seems to contradict what Lama Zopa is saying. And that's important to not kind of skirt over the top of, but rather to dig in and ask, well, then why would he say that? Yeah, why would he say that? So before we kind of get into the why's would he say that, does that distinction make sense? That everything that is the subject matter related to the, to the fact of emptiness, that's definitive. Everything else is provisional, meaning it needs to be interpreted. It needs to be thought out with logic and reasoning and context, remembering the audience, remembering the purpose, looking at it through the filters of the time, looking at it through the filters of the student, you know, really everything in Buddhism needs critical analysis, everything. And if the subject matter is emptiness, it doesn't need that because that's the final view. Whatever we're talking about is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises, everything. So we can kind of land on that. So if the subject matter is that, we can rest. If the subject matter is anything other than that, it's going to need a discussion. Does that, that framing work? That's a very Nagajuna, very Lama Tsongkhapa, very Prasangika view. Um, and it's very tidy, but does it sit well? Everything needs to be interpreted or discussed or elaborated on unless we're talking about emptiness. Yeah. So in a way, it for me, when I first heard that teaching on the definitive and, and 
<clears throat> on the interpretive or the provisional, sometimes it's called either way, provisional or interpretive are synonymous in this context. When I heard those teachings, for me, it was very reassuring because it was really an invitation to challenge anything that I read related to convention and be able to use my own logic to say, was that just a product of its time or just a teaching for that group of people? Or is that something that is relevant for us here and now today? And I'm not going to just discard it because it's old or it seemed of a certain time. I'm definitely going to look at it deeply, but I'm allowed to. And not only am I allowed to, I'm kind of need to in order to make it real and for it to land. That nothing I read in Buddhism is going to be something passive that I need to just take on. That I need to just swallow because it's there. That everything needs to be kind of analyzed and then asked, is that something that's in alignment with the core truths and the core tenets of Buddhism that are the core of my belief system? And it'll, it'll, there will come times where you're reading a commentary and it's brilliant, it's amazing, it's brilliant, it's amazing. And then you get to one section and you're like, Mount Meru's the center of the universe, Abhidhamma Kosha, are you sure? <laughs> right? And But science says, but logic says, but oh, maybe it's a metaphor. Okay, maybe I don't need to take that so literally. Maybe that is a product of its time. And maybe the fact that certain parts of the Amidharma seem to suggest that the world is flat, doesn't mean the world is flat, <laughs> right? And, you know, if we just kind of swallow it because it's there, we're kind of letting ourselves down in terms of practice. And all of our teachers would say, question what I say, don't just take it on board because I say it. But part of why they put that out there is that it's built right into Buddhism that all of these teachings need to be interpreted and contextualized. Don't take things literally unless we're literally talking about the fact of emptiness. Yeah, don't take things too literally. Yeah, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, so because the quote is from Tsongkhapa, is it inferred that he's talking about Nagarjuna's view of emptiness then? Or is there something else to be said around this with the, the four tenant systems? Nope, he's going straight Prasangika, he's going straight Nagajuna. And later in the chapter, he quotes Nagajuna saying the same things, as well as some passages from sutras as well. Okay, thank you. Yep. So, you know, like the idea of adopting the attitude that everything's been purified, even though you know it hasn't been, adopting the attitude that this tantric presentation is definitive, even though it actually is interpretive, has some benefit. So I get, there's these razor's edge thinkings, which is why Tantra is such a delicate thing and why it's not for people with unstable minds, because you really can make yourself crazy with this stuff. But if you're staying very grounded in the three principal aspects of the path, and you're staying very grounded in the fact that ethics are essential for any kind of stability, particularly ethics, yeah, hopefully bodhicitta, yeah, hopefully remembering emptiness, but ethics, 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 and ethics gets reinforced by renunciation, sure, but just like keeping at the core that to say that things are empty doesn't mean that there is no such thing as good and bad or help and harm. It just means good and bad, helpful and harmful exist within a context. Yeah, it means not from their own side, but that doesn't mean not existent. Yeah, so we hold those things that we know to be true, both experientially and logically, and then we layer onto it the tantric view, which is trying to unite wisdom and method simultaneously, knowing that our poor little pea brains can't quite do it yet, but we adopt the attitudes that they can, and gradually they'll be able to. Yeah. It, it's it's weird, but I think when you're just kind of in the practice itself, just going with it, there's an immediate kind of impact that can happen on a good day when you're really connected. So it's it's worth experimenting as long as you're feeling stable with it. Yeah, Christine, go ahead. One of uh, one of my one of my teachers said something once, and it's helped me a lot. And he goes, you know, if you if you if you start with impermanence. It's an easier step to get to emptiness than to go straight to emptiness. Yeah. And um, 
although impermanence so what's that relationship i do that a lot and it does it does help me impermanence i can i can kind of go there pretty easy yeah and then every now and then it slips into emptiness or at least not directly obviously but can you talk a little bit about that statement well, uh, you know, the, the Buddha was so skillful in that some of the very straightforward teachings like impermanence and like equanimity point you to emptiness without really being explicit about it. So impermanence is the fact that compounded phenomena change moment to moment, that they rely upon causes and conditions. And so that means they cannot be inherent. Yeah, if they rely on causes and conditions in order to arise, they can't have just magically popped out of nowhere causelessly. Yeah, and if they're changing moment to moment, then there's momentary causation at play as well. So that proves they can't be inherently existent. What is something not being inherently existent? That's the same as saying it's empty of inherent existence. It's a characteristic that it lacks. So looking at impermanence points you to the first layer of dependent arising. Yeah. And then the second layer of dependent arising that we look at is that everything relies upon or is in is um, dependent upon parts and context. And that applies to both permanent things and impermanent things. So even things that are static in the sense of not undergoing momentary change, something like uncompounded space is not changing moment to moment, but it still has parts and it still depends on context. Yeah, you can only say space in contrast to something that is not space. Yeah. And then the most subtle layer of dependent arising is that everything depends upon being imputed on a valid basis. Yeah, being merely labeled by the mind on a valid basis. So that subtlest level of dependent arising also applies to both impermanent and permanent things, but is much harder to kind of get your head around and it needs a lot more thought because you're like merely labeled by the mind. How does that work? What is a valid basis? What makes a valid basis? And then you need to start looking at valid cognition and looking at minds and mental factors and understanding what makes a valid mind and understanding what makes a valid convention without that slipping you into thinking conventions are inherent because of course they're not. So that subtlest layer is hard. That first layer of seeing how things that change moment to moment are produced, that helps you understand emptiness. Yeah. It, it moves you in the right direction. And then just in a daily advice kind of way, it makes you go with the flow. Yeah. If you realize that most of the things in your life are changing moment to moment, then when it's great, you enjoy it. You don't expect it to stay. When it's bad, you don't freak out. You know it won't be forever. You know, so also just on that like surface level, it chills you out. And the more used to that idea you get, the more you see its relationship to pointing you to emptiness. Yeah. So it's a lot, you know, it's a lot to process. But when you get into the practice itself, you can do the same exact practice again and again, and each time bring in more layers and more depth and more kind of background knowledge and the practice takes on more and more significance. And that's part of the, the beauty of doing the same practice every single day is that you can bring in more depth and more layers and your understanding of what each piece means gets fleshed out. But what you're actually doing is sim, you know, pretty similar day to day. It just goes deeper and deeper and deeper, augmented by the thoughts you're having outside of practice. Yeah. So um, in the chat, um, I think I'm confused about this being interpretive because it isn't the essence of the practice emptiness so that it would make it definitive. I'm sorry, I'm gonna need you to retype it in a way. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, the, basically the subject matter being about emptiness makes it a definitive teaching. The subject matter of being about anything other than emptiness makes it an interpretive teaching. But if you want to ask a follow-up question, please, yeah, go ahead and rewrite in the chat because I didn't quite understand what you were asking. Yes, Nay, go ahead. Um, Venerable, uh, I just want to make sure I understood correctly when you were talking about the second level of dependent arising of parts and wholes and saying that um, 
Does impermanence necessarily imply parts? Um, that's a good point. Yeah, I don't know if I would say yes quickly. Certainly everything that's impermanent also has parts, but I don't know if it being impermanent implies parts or that's just another aspect of all impermanent things. It's just that the causal level of dependent arising only applies to impermanent things. Yeah, that level only applies to, to impermanent, yeah. whereas the other two apply to all phenomena, whether impermanent or permanent. Uh, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah, good question. Okay, um, so isn't the subject matter of the sadhana emptiness? So would that make what was written by Lama Zopa definitive? The subject matter of the sadhana is always conjoined with emptiness, but the subject matter isn't emptiness. So explicitly the subject matter has to be emptiness for it to be classed as a definitive teaching explicitly. So with Tantra, that's why it's that razor's edge where you know ex explicitly we're saying Medicine Buddha is blue. He's holding this, he's doing that. He made these prayers, he has this mantra. That's what is presented on the text. And then what we're to understand is all of that is empty because it dependently arises. But that's not explicitly in there. So it's not a definitive teaching. And yet all of Tantra combines wisdom and method. So it's it's this tricky case where, as if, where if it was a sutra teaching, it would be a lot easier. But even in the sutra teachings, we're training and trying to remember that everything is empty, even if we're just talking about anger or patience or something. So if you think about the teachings on like the six perfections, you know, just a nice good six perfections teachings like yay generosity, yay ethics, yay patience, yay joyous effort, yay concentration, yay wisdom. Those all seem very straightforward and just to be talking about what they're talking about. But when you get to the end of the chapter in the more in-depth texts about them, you realize that all of them need to inform all of them, right? So generosity needs to be informed by ethics. It needs to be informed by patience. It needs to be informed by concentration. And it needs to be informed by wisdom, which means when you practice generosity, you need to remember the wisdom realizing emptiness and all the rest of them. So Sutra is moving you towards Tantra Tantra has wisdom and method combined all the time, but in Sutra, we're trying to remember emptiness even while we're talking about conventions. Yeah, it's just moving that merging closer and closer and closer, but it's still variations on a theme. Yeah. So Lama Zopa's view about, you know, saying that this teaching on it'll get you out of the lower realms, guaranteed, that's definitive, you know, words to that effect, that's about, from my perspective, from my opinion, I think what he's saying is, see what happens if you adopt that attitude during your practice. It might help you see the goal. Yeah, it might help you ripen through rehearsal. Not that literally, <laughs> you you have a little ant on your hand, you say, taya ta on bekenze bekenze ma, bekenze bekenze rajasomo gati soha. <laughs> magically he's freed from the lower realms. But it does mean you've helped his conditions to ripen that to be the case in the future. It has power. It's not like it's not powerful. It is powerful. But the directness of what he said needs a lot more contextualization. Yeah. So, but you know, you don't have to take my word for it. Like really sit with how Lama Tsongkhapa's view goes together with Lama Zopa Rinpoche's view and how you might marry them up and also what sort of questions you might ask someone like Lama Zopa Rinpoche if you were in front of him you know because these are the meaty questions that a Lama loves so even if you can kind of get the question sharper and clearer I think it is a good mental exercise yeah so gently and gently but um I'll just, uh, I'll leave you with this little section from Lam Rim and then we'll have a stretch. So this is just a reminder. This should be mostly review, but it's a little bit more of a technical review than what we've been doing in this course. So this is again from Lama Tsongkhapa. The stages by which you enter that reality are as follows. 
So first, having contemplated in dismay the faults and disadvantages of cyclic existence, you should develop a wish to be done with it. That's renunciation. Then understanding that you will not overcome it unless you overcome its cause, you research its roots, considering what might be the root cause of cyclic existence. So because of your renunciation, you're curious. What's, what's, where did it come from? How will it end? You will thereby become certain from the depths of your heart that the reifying view of the perishing aggregates or ignorance acts as the root of cyclic existence. You then need to develop a sincere wish to eliminate that. Next, seeing that overcoming the reifying view of the perishing aggregates or ignorance <laughs> depends on developing the wisdom that knows that the self, as thus conceived, does not exist. Yeah, as thus conceived meaning seeing the self as inherently existent, that self doesn't exist you will then see that you have to refute that self. So be certain in that refutation, relying upon scriptures and lines of reasoning that contradict its existence and prove its non-existence. This is an indispensable technique for anyone who seeks liberation. After you have thus arrived at the philosophical view that discerns that self and that which belongs to the self lack even a shred of intrinsic nature, you should accustom yourself to that. This will lead to the attainment of the embodiment of truth. Okay, so, and then all of that under the heading of we do that for the sake of all sentient beings. So the relationship between renunciation and the wisdom realizing emptiness is the more renunciation you have, the more you want to realize emptiness, right? And wanting to realize emptiness, you really investigate how to realize emptiness. Yeah, and you're really looking at dependent arising as the fuel to trigger or elicit that understanding. Yeah, so just let it brew, let it brew. The more times, the more different ways you hear it, the more it's gonna land, but we'll take a five minute break and then we'll just do the meditation. And we'll go ahead and do our meditation on Medicine Buddha. So if you wanna get yourself nice straight back, Settle into your space, settle into your body. And as you prepare your mind for meditation, just do a quick scan through the body, up and down the spine, seeing if you can encourage relaxation and balance. And then we'll revive our refuge in bodhicitta. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened <clears throat> to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. And repeating that twice more to yourself, letting it connect.
and the seven limb prayer. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of all others to the great enlightenment. This ground anointed with perfume strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Yadam Guru Ratna Mandala And visualize the seven medicine Buddhas in a stack above the crown of your head. Shakyamuni Buddha at the top. And whether you see them clearly or not, just have the strong sense that all of them are present and with you. Each having been ordinary beings at one point, having made countless aspirational prayers to benefit beings of the degenerate age, having infinite care and compassion for us. And we focus at the first medicine Buddha underneath Shakyamuni Buddha. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, renowned glorious king of excellent signs, I prostrate, offer, and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, renowned glorious king of excellent signs, I prostrate, offer, and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, renowned glorious king of excellent signs, I prostrate, offer, and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. He sounds down streams of nectar light, all the way down through the Buddhas, down to the crown of your head, down and through, purifying and blessing your mind. Think that that's happening while repeating the prayer four more times under your breath. He happily accepts your request, dissolves and absorbs into the Buddha below him. And we shift to the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, king of melodious sound, brilliant radiance of skill, adorned with jewels, moon and lotus. I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, king of melodious sound, brilliant radiance of skill, adorned with jewels, moon and lotus, I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, king of melodious sound, brilliant radiance of skill, adorned with jewels, moon and lotus, I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. Repeating that prayer four more times under your breath, together with the visualization of light coming down through the stack, down through your crown, 
down and through, purifying and blessing. And he dissolves and absorbs down into the Buddha below him. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, stainless excellent gold, great jewel who accomplishes all vows, I prostrate offering, go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, stainless excellent gold, great jewel who accomplishes all vows, I prostrate offering, go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, stainless excellent gold, great jewel who accomplishes all vows, I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. Four more times to yourself, together with the visualization, purifying and blessing. He dissolves and absorbs into the Buddha below him. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, supreme glory free from sorrow, I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, supreme glory free from sorrow, I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, supreme glory free from sorrow, I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. Four more times with the visualization. He dissolves and absorbs into the Buddha below him. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, melodious ocean of proclaimed Dharma, I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, melodious ocean of proclaimed Dharma, I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, melodious ocean of proclaimed Dharma, I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. Four more times under your breath, together with the visualization. He dissolves and absorbs into the Buddha below him. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, delightful king of clear knowing, supreme wisdom of a notion of Dharma, I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, delightful king of clear knowing, supreme wisdom of a notion of Dharma, I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. 
To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, delightful king of clear knowing, supreme wisdom of an ocean of Dhamma, I prostrate, offer, and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. Four more times, together with light, purifying and blessing. He dissolves and absorbs into the Buddha below him. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, medicine guru, king of lapis light, I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, medicine guru, king of lapis light, I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, medicine guru, king of lapis light, I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. To the Bhagawan Tathagata Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, medicine guru, king of lapis light, I prostrate offer and go for refuge. May your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. Four more times, together with light. And granting your request from the heart and holy body of medicine guru, infinite rays of white light pour down, completely filling your body from head to toe. They purify all your diseases and afflictions due to spirits and their causes, all your negative karma and mental obscurations. Your body becomes clean and clear as crystal. Light rays pervade the sentient beings of the six realms especially the being you're doing the practice for, whether yourself or others or both, thinking they become purified as we recite the mantra. Om Namo Bhagavate Bekanze Guru Bhadruya Prabharadzaya Tathagataya Ahate Samyak Samburaya Tayata Om Bekanze Bekanze Maha Bekanze Bekanze Radha Samugate Soha Tayata Om Bekanze Bekanze Maha Bekanze Bekanze Radha Samugate Soha Tayata Om Bekanze Bekanze Maha Bekanze Bekanze Radha Samugate Soha Tayata hum bekanze bekanze Maha bekanze bekanze Radha samugate soha Tayata hum bekanze bekanze Maha bekanze bekanze Radha samugate soha Tayata hum bekanze bekanze Ah, Bekanze, Bekanze, Radha Samugate Soha. Tayata Hom Bekanze, Bekanze, Maha Bekanze, Bekanze, Radha Samugate Soha. And feel great joy and think. 
How wonderful that I'm now able to lead all sentient beings into the Medicine Buddha's enlightenment. And the Guru Medicine Buddha melts into light and absorbs. Your mind becomes completely one with the Dharmakaya, the essence of all the Buddhas. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. And remember the emptiness of yourself, the practice, the medicine Buddha and the results, all dependently arisen. All profound and powerful, but not from their own side. All dependently arisen. Okay, you can relax your attention. So that's the short version, and um, it can get a little bit laborious to say the names of the medicine Buddhas seven times each. So I usually, when I'm by myself, I do three times quite loud, you know, in case there's any like beings around to hear and benefit. But then to kind of give myself a little break, I say the rest of the four just under my breath. So air is coming out, but it's not quite needing as much energy so you do what suits you if you want to say all seven times you know at normal speed or normal speech volume do what you want to do but um so it's good to say it seven times but don't feel like you have to force it if you're feeling a little bit like low energy or something like it's forced so um there's a lot of versions of that practice and i'll send you links to those um and this weekend is the tara retreat so if you want to come you're very welcome whether on online or in person and all the info for that is on the Vajrapani website. So I'll um, uh, see you next week. But of course, on Thursday, if you guys want to come to that first session of the retreat, like last time, it'll start at seven instead of six, and it'll just be a meditation. It won't be a class. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Night. Thank you, Venerable. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you so much.